Hey everyone, welcome to Animals Voice Podcast. Today I'm joined by Sean Fougere. He's a police officer with the OPP. And uh, with us, we've got Cal, his service dog. And today, uh, Sean's here to share his story with us. And thank you so much, Sean, for taking the time to be a part of our podcast today. Oh, you're very welcome. Now, I know this is a topic that I'm quite interested in, and I'm sure our listeners will be uh, as well. And of course, we want to just kind of start off by getting a little bit of your your background and and learning about maybe what are some of the steps that led you to developing your your mental health condition. Um, With mine, it's what what is referred to as cumulative post-traumatic stress disorder. So basically, when I came on the job 25 years ago, uh, and two years before that as uh, as a dispatcher, times were a little different. Um, there wasn't as much uh, as far as crisis intervention. Uh, the officers, we didn't really speak of it. It was just one of those things where you went and did your job and you left. Um, what happened early on in my career uh, had a, quite a few traumatic events that kind of rocked my foundation as far as uh, all of a sudden it made the world not not as clean as I thought it was. Like I grew grew up in Northern Ontario with a loving family. I, I did everything. I, I'm just going to say normal for the sake of saying the word normal. Sure. Um, but once I came on the job, all of a sudden I saw like different parts of humanity that was evil and also car accidents and seeing what happens to people. So you can prepare as much as you want for mm-hmm. different things, but until you actually see things, experience things, hear things, uh, and a couple of them really shook me, um, but I didn't know what to do about it. Uh, back then, uh, we just sort of laughed it off, or we went out and, you know, had a couple beer or uh, joked around, and uh, and just sort of let it go. Sure, yes. Bottle, push it down. Right. And that's probably what happened with not probably that is what happened with me over the course of probably the first uh, five six years of my career. Just things that emotionally I wasn't prepared to handle and. I didn't know what to do with it. So that's where the beginning started to come. So I just hit it all uh, and just kept it down, down, down. So you're at the point, obviously, where, um, you know, you've come to recognize that there is there is an issue going on that you, you need to sort of take action. Uh, what sort of moved you towards that place and moved you towards recovery? Well, well the recovery part is... A fantastic story in itself but first I had to go down like a really evil path of destruction of of self-destruction and and, and that's basically what I did it wasn't until uh, about 2000 and late 2006 to 2007 when I actually asked for help with our uh, four psychologist and then I got referrals to other psychologists and assessments and but things just, it still wasn't at the point where it seemed to be acceptable, accepted. I still wasn't able to fully come out at work and say this is what it was. Everything was hush-hush because uh, I didn't want everybody to look at me as, oh, my God, there's the wimpy cop. You know what I mean? Oh, look at him, Mr. Sensitive Boy. And all those at that time were huge. Um, I think that the OPP, especially I know now, is at a much different place where where we've grown by leaps and bounds. We've got special units now. We have special wow. protocols. I mean, the OPP now is, I don't know all of the other services or forces, but I know that we're on the cutting edge uh, for new officers. For us older guys like me, unfortunately, I had to go through the barrels of it. But once I, once things started to unravel, they unraveled rather quickly. Uh, I did turn uh, to uh, self-medicating by using alcohol. Um, that was one of those things where if I had a bad day or a bad shift, oh my goodness, it kind of took the edge off. And instead of doing the, you know, talking more, that's what ended up happening. So then you kind of make everything worse, right? So now I've got, I'm dealing with these emotions I don't know how to handle. Right. And I'm topping it all off with alcohol, which gives me a temporary numbing sensation but then at the end when you're coming off of it then it just amplifies depression anxiety panic and everything just started to unravel um to the point where uh i was in my office one day and at no point did i ever think that i would even contemplate uh suicide or 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 ending my my life because i'd been to a number of scenes where suicide was there and i I've never believed in suicide. People go, they've committed suicide. I don't think you commit suicide any more than you, you don't will a heart attack. Uh, like the brain is an organ that, that, that was failing. And that's what I honestly believe. Mental health is not a condition of 
just smile, it'll go away. It's an organ issue. And uh, once I started to wrap my head around that, it started to feel better. I got over the, you know, without getting into too many details, I did have an incident at work in the change room where I did take out my gun and I had full intentions of ending my life. Uh, I never believed ever that I would put myself in that position, but I did. Um, luckily with, uh, I have very strong family pillars. Uh, my, my wife is uh, my, my biggest rock, my biggest inspiration. And we had many of conversation before the, the gun incident that let me reflect and put the gun back in my holster and ask for help. And that was the beginning for me. I went to Homewood Health Treatment Center for alcohol addiction, but also for post-traumatic stress disorder. So I was in trauma groups for uniform members, like military, police. Then I was in trauma groups with everybody because post-traumatic stress disorder is not just for police and military and first responders. It affects everybody. That's right, yeah. And that's when I realized, hey, man, I'm, I'm normal. I'm really, really normal. And that's when I started to realize it's not, I don't have this just because I'm a police officer. I have this because of traumatic events. I was in a room with people that were, that were involved in fatal car crashes that were abused as children that were, and the, the way their mind was working, their triggers, their responses to triggers were the same as mine. And, and I think that was the beginning where I started to, um, before I started to feel, you know what, you're not weird. You're not weak. You're not, I released the shame. I, I, got my self-esteem back and I started to battle. And that was the key for me is starting to battle. What a strong story. It's incredible to, to have you share this with us and um, and to hear everything that you go through. And I, I really, you know, I can understand and identify with the piece about that, yeah, when you start to talk to other people and hear other people's stories, it's not a one-person deal or a mm-hmm. one-scenario deal, right? There's so many different things that can trigger it. So, yeah, that's really interesting. Now, I want to quickly talk about Cal, yep. because you brought Cal with you. Cal yep. is your service dog. So tell us a little bit about who Cal is, what Cal does for you. Yep. Uh, Cal is a East German Shepherd. Uh, it's called Working Class. He's in the King Shepherd family. Um, I was very blessed. Uh, after Homewood, after the trauma uh, counseling and things were going well, uh, I was still having problems with external triggers. I have a lot of auditory triggers, uh, children screaming, laughing, or playing, uh, large groups if I feel boxed in, and I was still having issues. Um, I did have a relapse in the alcohol after a couple of years of sobriety because all of a sudden, while I was getting all this remarkable treatment and stuff, I still wasn't dealing with the triggers. And after a relapse and contemplating, you know, negativity again, uh, my wife and uh, her sister actually brought me to, to the, the Emerge. We met with an ER doctor and he talked to me and he realized, okay, you're not suicidal anymore. He says, but there's something missing. And he goes, have you ever thought about getting a service dog? He goes, because your type of triggers, if you get the right dog, can be life-changing. So no, I never did think of that. I went to my counselor at the time. She couldn't agree more. My medical doctor was absolutely, why didn't we think of this? So basically, they they wrote a letter, uh, like a prescription, for lack of a better term, and that's what they call it, the doctors did. Based on, here's his diagnosis, like the technical term of post-traumatic stress disorder, and the service dog, if properly trained in these areas, would be a benefit. So that's how it started. I contacted uh, the OPPA, which is our uh, association. They gave me the name of a, of a not-for-profit organization called United by Trauma. And they're a team made up of a, of a military veteran and a police officer and another gentleman who I'm not sure of his trade. But they had this not-for-profit. And what they did is raise money throughout the year and trained primarily German Shepherds and Belgian Malinois because police and military are familiar with the breed, right? I mean, not to sound goofy, but I wouldn't feel as confident if I had a, had a poodle at the end of the leash, right? You know what I mean? Like, like I'm I'm a big guy. I don't need a poodle, right? And and, and trust me, I have a 10 pound wiener dog at home. It's not like a size is an issue here, but all of a sudden I got accepted into the program right away uh, just because of my diagnosis and the types of triggers I have. So to shorten it down, once you go into training, uh, Cal was uh, purchased from a breeder in West Virginia, actually, mm-hmm. at eight weeks old. And they begin training him right away at eight weeks old. So they have advanced um, advanced obedience training, and, and, and they work with, with specific trainers. I started to get to know them around six months old. Okay. And then I would go, I went down a couple times. And then it wasn't until the dogs were 
11 months old mm -hmm. and there was four of us. There was another OPP officer who was retired and then a couple other civil, uh, not civilians, municipal police officers and me. And there was about eight dogs. And we went down for a two week period at their training area in the Canada, and we work with all of them. Oh, okay. Uh, but for about three, four days, and the trainers watched the dogs, and they watched us, and they paired the dog basically chose you. And my initial interview with them, I remember was because you know I had a family uh, with a smaller dog, and I'm you know not overly active and stuff, so they were going to give me a smaller female black German Shepherd. But. As we were training, and we would train at the Ottawa Mall, like at Rideau Centre and the Vanier Mall and stuff, what they realized is I needed a dog that was had an attitude in order, because the female shepherd, she was a little smaller, she was a little skittish. Oh, okay. So if somebody came and it surprised us, she jumped, I jumped, everybody jumped, and it didn't help. And it was make so all of a sudden, Cal... Uh, was the youngest one. He was a month old younger than everybody else, but they deem him an alpha male, right? So he's got a little bit of a of a strut to him. And when he heals, he doesn't heal like the proper heel is tight to your left. He actually likes to be a step ahead of me. Okay. And at the time they said, oh, we got to change us. Uh, if you'd rather, I'd rather not. I like it because he rounds corners first. He does everything first. People see him before they see me. So all of a sudden, Cal and I clicked, and uh, then we just had to work on certain triggers. Uh, so primarily, I have night terrors, uh, where in my sleep, a night terror is different from a nightmare, because a night terror, you truly believe you're in a battle. Like with me, uh, I, I would throw stuff on the floor, my nightstand, I'd, 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 I'd just lose it, get in fights. Kathy, my, my wife, would run out of the, like, not run out of the room, what am I saying, just roll over. Uh, she'd almost like sleep with one eye open type of thing. What Cal does is he sleeps in my bedroom all the time mm -hmm. and he detects different sleeping patterns. So example, if you start getting a night terror and I start to move, he wakes me up. He either tries to nudge me and if I don't listen, he's on the bed on my chest going, hey pal, wake up. Yes. I had two or three episodes with when I first got Cal within the first month or two that he did that. I'll have had Cal two years this July and I haven't had a night terror since wow. I've had him. It's, it just absolutely stopped. That's unbelievable. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So absolutely. So, and, and the other ones are, we've got a thing when I'm in a crowd, if I got to leave, like if it's getting too busy to this, I have a thing where I tell him, got to go. I, I tap him on his chin and go, got to go. And he gets me out the closest door out and he doesn't do it aggressively he's there's not a mean bone in him but he's a german shepherd and when he, when he decides we're walking through through a crowd we're walking through the crowd the crowd moves right that's right and out the door we go yep. um and the last thing that he does for me and actually here at the conference was funny there was a group of people i hadn't seen in a while there was three of them and they all started giving me hugs and they all got really tight and all of a sudden cal weaved in between all of us and put himself between me and the three ladies just like that and they noticed right away holy cow nothing n nothing aggressive but yeah. just those so those are the three key areas that he helps me with uh, but I mean, before that, I didn't leave the house for almost a year and a half. And if wow. I did, I'd have to hold my wife at times by the back of her belt to, to get through a crowd. Yes. And now Cal's basically given me my life back. Like we're here in beautiful Niagara Falls and I had a walk today out on the falls with my wife. I couldn't have done that. Not even close to doing that before. That's incredible. So that's basically Cal in a nutshell. He's just an absolute rock star is what he is. That's amazing. I, I can tell you that I've, I've had the pleasure of hearing other service dog stories. And it, it doesn't matter how many times. Every story is different. Mm -hmm. Because like you say, each each case is particular to its own. And, and then also, you know, the dog picks you and then you work through yep. what you need. And I mean, it's just, I'm so blown away by how incredibly intelligent animals can be. And, mm -hmm. and it just helps uh, justify some of the work even that we do at the Ontario SPCA and yeah. why we support these amazing creatures. Sean, we're going to take a quick commercial break. If uh, you are tuning into this, you're getting how incredible Sean's story is and with his service dog, Cal. Come back. We'll uh, do a short break. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to Animals Voice Podcast. Um, we are joined here by Sean Fougere. He is sharing his amazing story. Uh, he and his uh, service dog, Cal, about, uh, you know, how Cal has helped you through your, your mental health uh, coming from, you know, being a police officer and everything that you sort of experienced. And, and it's been so interesting. So again, thank you so much for sharing this story with us. You're welcome. Now, Thinking from an Ontario SPCA perspective, we have agents and officers on the road who deal with very difficult situations. Um, Obviously, you know, you were saying similar uh, to to the work of a police officer in some cases. Why do you think it's so important for us to talk about mental health for officers and agents like ours or, you know, maybe even for uh, folks from other walks of life like you mentioned? I didn't realize how how important it was until this journey began for me. And, and you're absolutely right. Yeah, police officers and OSPCCA employees and anybody that in, that's involved in any sort of traumatic event. So I'd like to just say, you know, ev- everybody that feels like there's an issue, they've experienced something, they've seen something that's not sitting right. Why it's so important is until, this is my story, by the way, I'm not a doctor, nothing like that. So the, when I'm telling you this, it's just what's helped me. What I noticed is that once I started opening up and once I started my treatment program and started to roll, what I realized is that if you discuss this with somebody, of course, a trained doctor would be the best, but go, go see your spouse, your friend, your cousin, your doctor, your teacher, I don't care who it is, open up. It's amazing that the when you discuss whatever event it is that's bothering you, it's amazing just the dialogue, how that starts to cleanse it. What I mean by cleanse it is, it doesn't make it so big. It doesn't make it so oppressive, right? Because you've getting it out going, because then you're going to learn like I did. Right. I wasn't some weak cop that 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 couldn't handle my job. No, I, all of a sudden I, I understood I was a human being. And when I was in those rooms with those other police officers and soldiers, but also the people hearing their story, I realized, oh my God, this is as normal as any other health condition. And once I realized that, that's when I began my recovery. That's when I started to go, you know what, I'm not some person who's got this illness that I should be ashamed of. I have an illness that can be treated successfully if you take the right steps. And really the right step is just conversation. Find someone you trust, start to open up. It starts right there. Yeah. No, that's amazing. And I mean, once you obviously get to that point of, of determining whatever the next step is for you, if like you say, it's, you know, going in and talking to someone, um, you know, that's that's that moment, I feel like, where you, the change can start to happen. Yeah. But what do you think people should be looking for maybe to help recognize some of the symptoms? Like, are there any things that you might say, mm, if you're noticing this or that, you know, maybe you should start to look to chat with someone? Absolutely. I For me, what it was was... Uh, not being able to move on from from an event. So, for example, uh, I would live the event, it'd be over, it's been dealt with, so it's done. So whatever the tr- trauma was or the event was, it's over. So the, there's no more physical safety risk, there's no more audio or the visual stimulus, it's done. I'm at home even, if, and you can't shake it. And there's something bothering you and you can't process it. Or you start to feel guilty about maybe something you saw or maybe something that you did. Or I should have done more. Or And then you you can't. You just cannot get it out of your head. And then you'll be, okay, it's finally gone. You'll see something. And it triggers you. Bang! And you're right back in that event. That's when you're starting. Because, I mean, we can all see like a car crash and holy crap that bothers you but it's not at that level you'll you'll know when something just brings you right back to living a moment uh for me my my sleep was was incredibly disturbed uh so those for me that's what happened is when i can be easily brought back from uh a normal part of my day and bring back almost instantly and i feel like i'm back living it that's when I started going, holy moly. And that's when I started thinking I was a weirdo at first, right? Mm-hmm. And that's when I started pushing and pushing. It, and then once I started talking about it, I have a group of events that I've worked with through my my doctor. He's a, a psychologist. And now those triggers n- no longer exist to the point where if I experienced anything related to any of those events, I automatically was brought back. Now I'm not. I'm aware of they're in my past. Yes but I'm no longer disturbed by them. I'm no longer affected by them. 
I still have to deal with different triggers as a result of post-traumatic stress disorder. Yes. But the actual traumas, events, I'm no longer, you know, flash pointed right back to where, Mm -hmm. where, where it first happened. That's such a, that gives such an inspiring story of hope. Um, You know, everything that you've been able to share with us today, I think will help so many people. So I want to thank you very much, not just with sharing your story with us, but continuing. It's, it's obvious that, um, you know, you are someone who now can help others. You know, you can share your story and talk to people because like you say, maybe you don't know that this is something you're feeling and you're experiencing. So hearing it come from somebody else mm-hmm. and you kind of think, ah, maybe that's where I'm at, you know? And I, I really, it's it's so courageous of you and I, I can't thank you enough for sharing your story with us. Well, thank you very much. And if I could just say one last piece. Please. Is, is this simple. Everybody walking this planet is the same when it comes to mental health. Uh, here I was, a fully trained police officer, and literally you think that, you know, with our job that, you know, we see everything. We, we, we're we involved in huge events. We're not bulletproof. The whole society as a whole aren't. So what we need to understand is that there is never, and I can't say this enough, and this is why I'm talking, anybody that, that'll listen to me, I talk about, because I, I don't want people to go through the 10 years plus that I went through of hating myself, low self-esteem, alcoholism, blah, 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 because I thought I was some special person that was too weak. When all of a sudden now I know I'm like everybody else That's right. and everybody gets affected by it and it's treatable. You just got to recognize it and be willing to trust one person and talk. That's, That's right. why I keep talking about this today. Thank you so much, Sean. It's been an absolute pleasure. And to Cal down there do, being so quiet and on his absolute best <laughs> behavior, of course. Thank you so much to everybody for tuning into this amazing episode of Animals Voice Podcast. Keep listening to stories like these. We want to help make change. Um, and it's people like you, Sean, that help us do that. So uh, make sure you subscribe. Check us out on iTunes. And we'll catch you on another episode. Thanks, everybody. Uh-huh.